You are listening to The Green Flame, the DGR broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the grassroots to the global. We are your hosts, Max Wilbert and Jennifer Mernan. This episode is all about security and security culture for resistance movements and revolutionaries. We'll be discussing why this is important and how it can keep us safe, but how it's not also just about self-preservation, but effectiveness. It's about managing the risks. Yes, it is really important for movements to incorporate this from the very beginning. Our interview this week will be with Claude Marx. Claude Marx is the director of the Freedom Archives, leading its work since its establishment in 1999. He is a former political prisoner and lifelong activist. Next, we'll have an interview with the radical movement lawyer Will Falk. And our skill for this week will be focused on operational security. We'll be giving you some practical advice about protecting information from adversaries. I will be reading the poem Freedom by Sekou Sinke T.M. Kambui. He was a veteran civil rights activist and a conscious new African and was a political prisoner in the state of Alabama for decades. Our music this episode is from Beth Quist and Dead Perez. So before we move on to our show for today, I want to promote one thing that we can offer back to our listeners, and that is training. Here at Deep Green Resistance, we've been providing trainings and workshops to members of the community for almost a decade at this point. We have a lot of experience. We have a number of experienced trainers who are willing to travel to your community, wherever you may be, around the world, and provide some in-depth education on resistance tactics, grant strategy, revolutionary history, things like security culture, and many other important topics that you need, whether you're getting involved in basic above-ground political organizing, or whether you're looking into more serious forms of resistance. We're here to help. This is something that we offer to the community, and if you're interested, get in touch with us. We can work with you to try and make this happen. We're not interested in making money off of these. We're not trying to, you know, benefit ourselves. We're trying to proliferate and provide these skills in the community and normalize a higher level of training and effectiveness for everyone. So if you're interested, again, get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do to to make a training happen in your community. Claude, thank you so much for joining us for The Green Flame and for our production on security culture. What was COINTELPRO? COINTELPRO was a formally named program by the FBI uh, having to do with counterinsurgency against progressive movements. But it's also part of a real consistent history of the state interfering with both organized resistance and the potential for its development. It starts with the very inception of European colonialism, and it has to do with the willingness of the invading force, the colonial power, to inflict unlimited kinds of violence. Uh, in the course of stealing land and occupying what is now the nation state of the United States. And throughout its history, uh, it's been very consistent in its aggression and in its unrestrained violence. So some of that is military and some of that has to do with intelligence. And some of that combines uh, military attacks with intelligence to derail any kind of movement that chooses to project and organize behind a different vision of who's in power. You know, you have generations of Indian wars, you have enslavement of people from Africa who are brought to the Western Hemisphere, you have constant expansion through acts of war. So where I am here is originally Ohlone land and later became Mexico through the course of Spanish colonialism. And ultimately, as the United States expands, it is now neither Mexico or Ohlone land, but considered to be California. Counterinsurgency in the more modern period is attacking movements that in the 60s and 70s are re-raising some of the fundamental questions of who has power. And yet, 
you know, the antecedents of that, we're not just talking about the 60s and 70s, goes back farther. So that in relationship to, say, Black liberation, the head of the FBI plans to destroy the Garveyite movement as early as 1918. And Garvey is later imprisoned in 1925. And 1925 is a period that saw the height of black lynchings. Uh, 76 black people were lynched in 1919 alone. Later on, the FBI wiretaps and bugs the NAACP, even what's called the more mainstream civil rights movement and groups are targeted. Uh, We know now that People like Martin Luther King Jr. were under constant surveillance, including plots and attempts to create so much chaos in their lives that they're destabilized uh, emotionally with intent. Not that that's what killed Martin Luther King Jr., but, you know, both the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Martin Luther King Jr. were targeted not only by the FBI, but also by the Kennedy family, both by the president and by the attorney general, Robert. And the FBI refuses to protect civil rights demonstrators in the South in the 1960s, you know, targeting SNCC, uh, CORE, and other organizations who are trying to build unity and a level of resistance and demanding civil rights. Um, Later on, of course, more militant forces like Martin Luther, not more militant forces uh, like Malcolm X are targeted for assassination. And people like Robert Williams and Mabel Williams, who were organizing in Monroe, North Carolina in the 50s and really mobilizing the community to defend itself through force of arms to resist both Klan and police incursions into their community are driven into exile under false kidnapping charges. So this type of consistent behavior on the part of the state is because anything that tends to shake up their ability to function with impunity is attacked. The state's willingness to use force In these situations, we end up with people who are outright killed or arrested or set up, or those that resist are attacked with a tremendous amount of violence. Um, It's why we have political prisoners today, to this day, in prison from the era of the 60s, because they chose to fight back. It's a similar situation with the Native American struggle. There was an occupation of Alcatraz in 1969 that lasted 17 months and later Wounded Knee. And during Wounded Knee, where uh, the American Indian Movement occupied part of the Pine Ridge Reservation, there were 60 members of the American Indian Movement and their supporters who were killed violently on, on the reservation or close to the reservation over 340 people were physically assaulted in that same period of time, some in direct conflict with government troops, and some who were attacked by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which essentially had a trained goon squad, is what it was called. The goon squad functioned as an arm of the state, but was less formally recognized in many cases. And the training that it received was no different than the training of death squads that were rampant in the Americas as part of a foreign policy of the United States. And the consistency of the training that, you know, in the same period resulted in things like the coup that overthrew an elected president, Allende, in Chile, and follow that with a tremendous amount of unrestrained violence that was never really checked uh, despite international law. That coup, manufactured and supported by the United States, results in the same kind of 
death and atrocity. So the counterintelligence program that's internal to the U.S. is in fact part of a consistent attack, both internally and externally, to what the U.S. perceives to be any kind of threat to its hegemony. And it's not surprising if we start to understand that history that we continue to see unrestrained police violence in black and brown communities on reservations, um, international wars that are conducted by the U.S. in total breach of international law. It's really in the essence of what this settler colonial state is, was, and tries to project into the future that this empire chooses to rule the world. And there are no restraints as long as there's no countervailing force capable of checking it. The mechanisms that you're talking about here are consistent. It's terrorism, it's physical violence, it's psychological violence. I think there's a moral imperative to resist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which has to override whether or not it can succeed in any given moment. Because in fact, you know, there are human values that are held irrespective of the consequences, which is why people have consistently fought against it. I mean, a lot of people died in the Indian Wars. That didn't mean that they would stop fighting. A level of resistance is consistent. Historically, part of the problem is that through the educational process in this country, the real history is never taught through the kind of brainwashing that the media is at the center of because the corporate media, in fact, upholds the same values. It is very difficult and challenging unless you're looking to really cut through the lies to see what's really going on. To me, it's not a question of can we succeed or not. I think ultimately a more moral and just world can exist. The, the problem is we have to get to a point where we can force the change to happen mm -hmm. because uh, the state will not arrive at some kind of moral epiphany and change its mind without a tremendous amount of pressure and mobilization. So we have to figure out in the long run, you know, how to accomplish that and to, in fact, ensure that there's a more moral and just basis upon which to survive on the planet. Now, the planet may not survive either because of the avarice of capitalism and the imperial drive of empire. You know, they are not at all reluctant to continue to destroy the capacity of there to be a balance between life and the planet itself. And there is, in fact, a relationship between resource extraction and our ability to survive on a planet. That's also been a consistent aspect of the level of violence. So the violence is against life as we know it. I mean, the extinction of many kinds of animal and plant life, among other things. But also, you know, their interest is in increasing their wealth and control, irrespective of the um, capacity of balance to protect life moving forward. Those with power have no problem at all inflicting tremendous casualties on the less developed part of the world in order to reap the benefits. So we've all got these computers that we put in our pockets every day, and they don't come about by magic or without impact. The fact that they're manufactured has to do with the exploitation of the planet and a lot of people who put them together. You know, the sustainability question we have to be able to, you know, come to terms with living with less uh, than what we experience certainly in the United States or in the global north in order to protect the viability of life as we know it on this planet spinning through the galaxies. So, uh, you know, COINTELPRO is a small part of that, and yet we need to understand it as a way to get clarity on what this nation state is willing to do to maintain power. And the Freedom Archives that, that you've been part of for so long um, uh, is, a, is a wealth of information about the history of resistance, about movements and movement building. I think we have to protect the history of resistance and figure out how it can be an antidote 
to both the idea that you hate history because you can't identify with it. More importantly, if you know that there's a history of resistance, you may well become more interested in it because it can inform how we view the world today and what we do with our lives and what we commit ourselves to. So as an archive, we like to think of ourselves as a place where the history of uh, resistant politics and culture can live and thrive and be passed along Mm -hmm. to newer generations. And so we are an antidote to what people learn in most public education. There are examples, many examples of attempts to kind of reconstruct behind other values, social systems. Um, As I mentioned before, you know, there's, uh, as the world has developed, um, there were attempts at various stages to create things under the aegis of socialism, for example, uh, some of which survive and some don't. Um, When they crop up, they're attacked. So I mentioned Chile in 1973. Um, I mean, this is a more modern example. Obviously, the Russian Revolution happened much earlier, um, China as well, and in 1959, Cuba, which you mentioned in your question, where you have a country that doesn't have the resources of a more developed United States for various reasons. I mean, of course, it's been attacked and embattled in a struggle with the U.S. trying to put it out of its existence since its inception in 1959, um, because its values are antithetical to those of the U.S., where a fairly undeveloped country, a small island in the Caribbean, is actually able to provide better health care for its people, free education, uh, has eliminated homelessness for the most part. And, you know, what does that mean? That means that Cuba is an example, even though it's totally embattled with the largest empire in the world, has created a different kind of life for its people. By no means perfect, but nevertheless, those basic human rights that are talked about are in fact in place. You know, people don't have to pay for their water or their electricity or their health care or their education or their shelter. For the most part, that is the reality for 11 million people. And that's a pretty amazing accomplishment in the face of a consistent onslaught by the United States. Um, It says something about what's possible. So a place like Venezuela attempts that, and we see now the level of attack, the attempts at destroying an emergent set of values and a way of treating and guaranteeing people their rights is under frontal attack through many levels. I mean, threats of military invasion, uh, the creation of false leaders, um, uh, an economic embargo that basically has stolen the assets of Venezuela wherever they exist outside its borders, the driving of their economy into the ground with intent to create um, a tremendous amount of suffering. Um, you know, preventing medicine from being sent in uh, by normal means. You know, all that is about destroying an attempt to create a different form of social organization that is not fundamentally based on capitalism and exploitation. And yet, we see the suffering created by capitalism and exploitation. So um, I think we need to look to where there's been successes. And I would say Cuba is an example. 
But the violence and the chaos is global. It's in the African continent as well, which doesn't get looked at very much. It's certainly in Palestine, the relationship of the United States and the Israeli state in relationship to the Palestinian people is one of settler colonialism as well. And you can see what an apartheid system looks like on steroids when you observe the relationship between the Israeli state and the Palestinian people. That's uh, an example to me of a level of resistance that continues despite huge, overwhelming disparity of wealth, of military arms, of everything. You know, people will throw rocks at tanks. And why is that? Do they think they're going to destroy the tank with the rock? No, but it's important enough to resist colonial occupation, to do something. And, um, you know, hundreds of people are killed by snipers who engage in peaceful demonstrations in Gaza. And the world doesn't choose to sanction the sixth largest military in the planet over doing that. And they try to argue that, well, those people represent a threat to a fully armed military. I don't know. You know, we have to figure out ways of interceding and mobilizing ourselves to say that, not just to say that it's wrong, but until we do something more significantly, uh, that disparity that injustice will continue to exist. I would encourage people to visit freedomarchives.org and explore some of this. Thanks for that excellent interview with Claude. And I just want to add one element to this, which is the historical piece. We're talking about COINTELPRO here, which is a program that started many, many decades ago now. And I think we also need to recognize and point out that these techniques have evolved over time. They haven't remained static. So the government is still not using the same methods they used in the 50s and 60s and 70s to repress social movements today. They've moved much beyond this. They've become more advanced in their thinking. And part of this we can see with the proliferation of corporate security and private intelligence companies. These sorts of entities allow the state to bypass some of the public oversight that came to haunt programs like COINTELPRO and in fact made them, uh, force them to legally shut down eventually. Although, of course, we all know that these programs continued in more clandestine forms. So because of this whole neoliberal hegemony where the state begins to merge with corporate power and we see that the the separation between these sorts of entities uh, is becoming more and more blurry, this is the new form of state power. This is the new form of COINTELPRO. And of course, with the proliferation of internet technologies, of ubiquitous digital surveillance and so on, the ability of the state to gather information on our movements, our social connections, our networks, our organizations, our funding, communications, and so on, is that much more advanced. And so we need to be aware of this. We need to understand it so that we can fight it. The point of this information is not paranoia. Again, it's to make us more effective. And we'll be hearing more about that uh, from Will Falk here in just a minute. Sekou Sinke T.M. Kambui, known to the state as William James Turk, was of Cherokee and African ancestry, born on September the 6th, 1948. He grew up in the civil rights movement and became active in providing security for civil rights marches and meetings, including those of the SCLC, SNCC, and Corps. He joined or worked with groups such as the Alabama Black Liberation Front, the Provisional Government of the Republic of New Africa, the Black Panther Party, and the Black Liberation Army. Sekou was convicted of the 1975 murders of two men, 
a KKK official from Tuscaloosa, and a multimillionaire from Birmingham. He spent decades in the Alabama prison system as a political prisoner. During his incarceration, he never ceased working for the liberation of his people from the oppression of the state. Sekou applied his talents as a jailhouse lawyer, community organizer, and educator within the prison community and beyond. Sekou's poem, Freedom, appears in the book Hauling Up the Morning, Writings and Art by Political Prisoners and Prisoners of War in the U.S., which was published in 1990. Freedom. Boom, boom. Sunday morning, 5.30 a.m. That was a shotgun shot. Someone is taking the bid for freedom into their own hands. Freedom. Freedom. It was not me. I was brought out of my slumber by the sound of the gun's boom. Breathlessly, I lay there, conjuring images of this brave and courageous brother, springing upward, over the wire, leaping down, rushing across the road to the woods, taking his life in his own hands, looking the threat of death in the eye, defying death, and surrounded by the buckshots flying from the slave keeper's gun, stretching his arms and legs for freedom. Freedom! The slave quarters is in a noisy, boisterous clamor. Words ground together, joining, linking together feelings, thoughts of hope, ideas of freedom, fear of death, hope of success, doubtful thoughts that imply there is no way to freedom, Freedom is considered elusive, inaccessible, yet our courageous brother has made the woods. He is free for now. He is stretching his arms to embrace his bid for freedom. His bid for freedom. Their words make jokes to hide the hope, the fear, the question, the wonder, the wish that it had been they who had had the guts to make the leap. Reach out to freedom. Freedom! The slaves are cut off from news of their brother's plight, so they cringe and hide behind their fear exposed, naked fear of defying death, of choosing freedom. Freedom! There are the slaves who left behind in captivity pray their brother's success, wish the dog set on his heels in the woods miss his scent, miss their shots of steel bearing death to their brother, death to freedom, freedom. There are other slaves who left behind in captivity pray their brother's capture, wish the dog set on his heels in the woods catch his scent, don't miss their shots of steel bearing death to the courageous brother, the brother who exposed their fears, their passive acquiescence in their own enslavement, death to freedom, freedom. It's 11.35 p.m. Sunday night. He's at the gate. He failed. He is captured. Damn it, why? Why didn't he make it? Why did freedom remain elusive for the brave brother? Freedom, freedom. Some of the slaves here are in pain. They hurt for the brother's failure to win his bid for freedom, freedom. Some of the slaves are laughing their embarrassment, their exposed fears, their lack of guts to defy their captivity with their own bid for freedom are appeased. They are comfortable again in their own fear to take the freedom leap, they say. I knew he wouldn't make it. No, no to freedom. Freedom. Sekou began his sentences for the murder convictions in 1978. He went on escape in 1982 and was recaptured in 1983. His 13th parole hearing was successful and he was released on parole in 2014. A month after his release, Sekou was diagnosed with fourth stage cancer. As he had all his life, he continued to speak and act, including participation in the Red Flame for Freedom tour until he joined the ancestors on May 10th, 2017. Come on.
up any way you can. For my homies in the street game, trying to get ahead. Homies, people sleeping on the sidewalks for bed. For the babies, born already on dope. Straight to his veins from the Coast Guard boat. Baby daddies, it ain't too late, you can't participate. Baby mamas, I know what you're going through, so sorry to disappoint you. Got a children, you the spark, you the energy, you the heart. To the grandmas, you the glue, cause you know things fall apart. To the BPs, the POWs, and my A's, to the ARs, to the HKs, to the M1s, to the AKs, to the comrades on the grind. Let me see who comes to mind. To my click, to stick, oh yeah, I can't forget. What up, Tahir, what up, Abu, what up, Common, what up, Bad Dude, to me. On. We about to get our feet on, that's F R double E on in case you get me. Okay, great. I'm here with Will Falk. Will, would you mind introducing yourself and letting our listeners know who you are? Yeah, I am a member of DGR. I've been a member for going on six years now. A little background on me. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Law School in 2012. After I graduated, I was hired uh, into the Wisconsin State Public Defender's Office in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where I, I practice as a public defender. Uh, I currently focus on uh, environmental law, especially rights of nature work. Our first question is, what is security culture? The way I define it is security culture is a set of behaviors, uh, policies, best practices uh, that uh, we can all implement in our, in our daily lives and that we can implement with the organizations that we work in and with to, to help you stay uh, as safe as possible and to avoid government repression. It's really important when I say something like that to be clear so that people understand that there's, there's nothing that we all can do that will guarantee our safety. The only thing that can guarantee our safety is if we if we never speak out if we never hacked out against the powers that be uh in short if we if we're not effective then then maybe we'll stay safe but if we're going to engage in resistance work there's nothing that i can tell you and there's nothing that you can do that is going to be that's going to keep you 100 percent safe often when when we talk about security culture there's a know your rights part of that discussion. And what I've gathered is that a lot of people understand law, especially criminal law, as simply a set of rules that judges or cop um, apply like a referee does in a game. Uh, And just like the rules of a game um, are pretty black and white, uh, if you do this, you get in trouble. If you don't do this, you don't get in trouble. The criminal, the criminal law, especially, um, is written down, and it is a set of rules. Those rules are applied and interpreted by human beings. Oftentimes, those human beings, um, if not always, have a, a very specific political motive and agenda. I like to describe law as more of uh, the art of persuading a judge to do something. For the purposes of a, of a conversation about security culture, do not fall into the trap of thinking of the law as these black and white rules, where if you follow those rules very carefully, you'll be safe. It sounds like you were in some ways anticipating a question that I was planning to ask a little bit later in the interview, which was, do these rules make us completely safe? Yeah, it's really important that people not think of law or security culture as this bulletproof vest that you can put on that's going to keep you completely safe. It's just, again, best practices, policies, and behaviors that we can all take to try and make ourselves as safe as possible. 
the know your rights stuff that you're talking about now in terms of understanding the law, understanding our rights when the police stop us or when we have any sort of interaction with agents of the state seems to some degree separate because it, it is largely, like you say, retroactive, whereas security culture seems like something that we can apply proactively in our movements on an ongoing basis to, to make ourselves safer. I'm wondering if you could talk in a bit more detail about the specific rules of security culture. A lot of the rules are are somewhat common sense, but and I think it's important to point out that they're common sense because they are things that we can all think ahead about and there are there are things that we can um, plan for. Um, and, and, and little, little things that we can keep in mind that, um, can contribute to, to the overall security culture. One of the very first rules is to not talk about illegal activities, to not brag about actions that you've been in, not to give away your comrades. So the first thing is just, uh, remembering that silence is often the best policy. That is not to say that people should not engage in dangerous or clandestine activities. But if you're going to do that, you need to only communicate that uh, through secure channels, preferably in person. And you need to designate times and spaces where you're going to talk about that stuff and make it clear that there's no discussion of those, those activities anywhere else or with anyone else. That the kind of silence, silence is always the best policy rule, can spread into um, everything from in person conversations to, um, you know, implementing uh, safe electronic communication. Uh, I'm not really an expert on these kinds of things, but, you know, with how much of the stuff that happens on the internet, through email, through our cell phones, that can be tracked by the government, it's really important to remember that those those channels are often not completely foolproof uh, and are not completely secure. Um, so the best kinds of conversations happen uh, in person, away from electronics, and within an affinity group that, that you trust. Which kind of brings us to a second rule of security culture, which is we all need to spend time building those affinity groups, building up our relationships with with other revolutionaries that we trust because that kind of trust and bonding uh, is going to be one of the, the, the main things that keep us safe. If we know all the people that we're engaging in certain activities with really well, we're less likely to be paranoid about their motives, paranoid about you know whether they um, are secretly a cop or something. Kind of a second rule of security culture is... Um, spend time getting to know the people you're working with in person, build and and develop uh, those relationships as best you can. DGR has come to some of our uh, understanding of, of security culture by really studying other resistance movements and other uh, groups to kind of see where those where those have broken down. There really needs to be a strict firewall between uh, people who are engaged in uh, what we call above ground work. So people that are primarily involved in things that are, are legal uh, propaganda, um, you know, uh, community building, uh, those kinds of activities. Those people need to maintain a strict firewall with people who are engaged in, below ground, uh, underground activities. And those are your um, more illegal activities, your sabotage, your um, clandestine activities. And a lot, of, a lot of movements in the past have been shut down um, because they didn't maintain that firewall. So you had uh, people who were spokespeople for the movement who are in very very public. They are, they're in the, the media attention. Everybody knows who they are because of their involvement with a, with a certain political movement. In the past, you've had some of those people involved in the, in the underground activities. So they have knowledge of illegal activities. They have knowledge of 
of who was involved in an action, um, where it happened, why it happened, what happened. And law enforcement is going to crack down on the people that are public first. So, you know, that just sort of common sense that if you have, if you have someone always calling for, for the dismantling of industrial civilization and someone attacks a fossil fuel pipeline terminal, the first people that they're going to go to are the people that are already making a lot of noise. Maintaining a firewall means that the people that are involved in above ground activities uh, need to not have any knowledge of underground activities. This, this rule is kind of related to the first rule about saying as little as possible um, outside of your affinity groups. And maintaining a firewall means that people that are engaged in above ground organizations, if they do end up finding about finding out about underground actions, they need to not talk about it. A fourth rule is in today's age, with the technology that the government has, with the technology that law enforcement has, while it is true that they do have a lot of technology and they have a lot of ways of spying on people when they want to spy on people, it's really important that we don't get paranoid because they rely on us being afraid of what they can do to keep ourselves in line. And if we get paranoid, we're playing right into their hands. We're kind of censoring ourselves or doing doing their job. So it's really important that we don't get paranoid. And hopefully that's what uh, security culture can do, is it, is it can make us feel more confident. If, if we're taking the right steps, it can make us feel more confident um, to take the action that we need, that we've considered all the risks and um, that we're making the best decisions we can uh, for each situation. Another one is just simply don't don't talk to the police. Um, there's there's no reason uh, why someone who is engaged in political work should should ever talk to the police, whether that's you know just casually on the street or um, obviously if they come knocking on your door and start asking questions. Um, there are only a very few limited times when you actually have to. Uh, answer the police's questions. And those limited situations are in some states and some jurisdictions. You do have to provide your name and other identifying information if the cops request it. But that's all you have to give them. You don't have to tell them anything about where you're going, what you're doing. It's really important to understand that the police can lie to you. The police can break the law to get you to break the law. And they routinely use tactics like this to get people in trouble. Not talking to the police gives the police less ammunition uh, to, to use against you. So the one thing people love to talk about with security culture is infiltrators. And what can you tell us about that and what security culture teaches in terms of how to respond to the possibility of infiltration? And these days, of course, it's not just the FBI and the police. It's also corporate security agents and private military corporations. Yeah, um, it's a legitimate concern. It, it does happen. It's important not to let fear of that paranoia of infiltrators become so strong that it paralyzes your activities. But there are things that you can do to make it less likely that an infiltrator will go unnoticed in your um, organization. Uh, you know, one of the first things you can do going back to what I said earlier is try and get to know uh, the people that you work with really well. Tr build personal relationships with people. Hopefully you can work with people that you've known for a long time. That's not always possible, but that's one of the first steps that you can take. A second step that you can take is have different levels of security clearance, basically, for uh, different types of conversations that you need to have. Um, you know, if if you if you have a group of people and twenty of them are only interested in kind of media support, and three or four are interested in sabotage and in in engaging in something that's illegal, you should only talk about the illegal stuff in a safe place with those three or four people. The the twenty. Uh, other people that don't want to engage in that, they don't need to know anything about that. 
you know, only provide information on a, on a need to know basis. There, another thing to look for is there are certain types of problematic behaviors that infiltrators or even just people that are going to be problematic for the organization engage in, you know, abusive behavior, uh, patriarchal behavior, racist or misogynist behavior. These are things that are going to make your your organization less effective anyway. Um, And if you notice those kinds of behaviors, it's important to, uh, you know, talk with a person about changing their behavior. Um, And if that doesn't work, not being afraid to cut those people out of out of your out of your groups and um, especially not let them have access to any kind of sensitive information. Um, another behavioral thing to watch out for, um, you know, is is addiction issues, uh, substance abuse issues. There have been a couple high profile uh, environmental organizations who were basically dismantled due to snitches who had uh, addiction issues and the cops were able to exploit their addiction issue and turn a person into an infiltrator. So for people that are engaging in serious resistance work, uh, there really shouldn't be any place for alcohol or drugs. And we need to be very careful in our movements not to trust too much sensitive information to people that we we know have alcohol or drug problems. These are some basic steps that you can take towards being mindful of infiltrators. There's a term that people use called snitch jacketing. It refers to a situation where someone suspects that someone else is a snitch and so they start spreading you know rumors about this person that they're a snitch and everybody gets scared and paranoid and they kick the person out of the group and it turns out that that person wasn't uh, an infiltrator or a snitch it's really important that Uh, If you suspect someone of being an infiltrator, to have a system in place where it is important to express legitimate concerns and counteract some of the paranoia that goes along with today's technology, um, but but also to uh, to address legitimate infiltration problems. And it seems like from what I've heard, that sort of snitch jacketing behavior or bad jacketing, as it's sometimes called, that's a technique that actually infiltrators and state agents will use themselves to sow paranoia and discord inside groups. Yeah. And it's a genius tactic. Not only does it sow uh, discord in the group, but oftentimes, our, you know, just naturally our attention is a drifts away from the accuser to the accused. So, you know, it, it could be that the person who is bad jacketing or snitch jacketing, as you, as you said, are actually an infiltrator themselves. It's, it's certainly something that we need to be aware of and something that we all need to just put in some practical steps towards being able to identify that kind of behavior. It seems like it takes a healthy dose of common sense and caution when dealing with these things. You need to work from a position of trust and getting to know the people you work with and sort of having a spectrum of that trust over time that you can build trust with people um, and maybe other people you just don't trust for some reason, and that's okay too. Um, but you can engage with those people, not the, let that paranoia stop you from doing the fundamental organizing work and recognize that you know that the entire purpose of having a repressive state apparatus is to stop us from being effective. So really focusing on the behaviors and are we getting our, our work done? Are we achieving our goals? Are we working towards our fundamental goals? That being the core element of security culture as a way to sort of clamp down on this paranoia. And in that sense, it seems like a really valuable tool for me Because it can be applied if you're completely above ground, if you're just going to a few protests now and then, Uh, you know, if you're a parent, if you're caring for your elderly parents or disabled family member or what have you, and you can't take any significant risks, or if you're engaged in above ground, nonviolent direct action in this middle ground, or if you're a full-on revolutionary engaged in serious underground clandestine work, you can apply these same principles of security culture and benefit from them. And it seems to me like 
that's part of building a culture of resistance. And that's why the word culture is in the title of, of security culture is that it's about normalizing these ideas and normalizing the fact that we're in this oppositional situation. We can talk about it as a war. We can talk about it as social conflict, whatever you want. But there are people trying to stop our movements and stop us from being effective. And one of the ways that they do that is through infiltration, disruption, uh, sowing discord in the movement, all these different issues. And, uh, you know, we need to fight against those through our common sense behavior and solidarity. Absolutely. Uh, There are, you know, there are probably really high level intelligence gathering and counterintelligence classes, you know, offered at American military academies, you know, that, that, that's definitely happening, but there are also a lot of groups with no, uh, formal education in this area with no, you know, uh, prior experience to dealing with these things who through common sense measures, you know, create uh, a culture that works for them and, and that, that keeps them safe. You know, I, I, yeah, I just want to reinforce what you said. It's, it's common sense stuff and it just takes us to, to think things through a little bit. The whole goal is to normalize a culture that makes us less paranoid, more confident, and ultimately more effective. So in this episode, we're going over security culture. We're talking about COINTELPRO, and I want to introduce you to another element of security and staying safe in order to be effective, which is operational security. And on this subject, I'm going to read you this article that I wrote a few months ago about operational security. Those in power do not hesitate to assault, imprison, torture, and sometimes murder those who fight capitalism, patriarchy, racism, the murder of the planet, and other elements of this global empire. And in order to do this, in order to repress us, they need information. So these state agencies, private military corporations, investigators, uh, the reactionary forces, they want to gather as much information on revolutionaries as possible. And the information they want includes where you live, who you associate with, where you go, where you work, and much, much more. So protection of information is therefore critical to the survival and effectiveness of resistance movements. And this becomes even more important if you're engaged in high-risk revolutionary work and direct action. Militaries around the world use a procedure called Operational Security, or OPSEC, to protect important information. And while I'm imposed, opposed to all imperialist militaries, we can and should learn from our adversaries. So therefore, I'm writing this article to help keep you safe and make you more effective. So what is OPSEC? OPSEC is defined as, quote, the protection of information that if available to an adversary would be detrimental to you or your mission, end quote. Implementing OPSEC is essential for revolutionaries and activists, but it can also be valuable for many other people, including women who are facing stalking, sexual violence, or abuse, immigrants who are facing uh, persecution, detention, and deportation, people of color who are threatened by racist uh, persecution and violence, or any sort of prominent individual facing doxing and harassment. So here's the five-step operational security process process. And this is as defined in Army Regulation 530-1 from the U.S. military. This procedure should be studied and implemented by all activists and revolutionaries. In fact, I think we need to practice OPSEC at all times in all situations. Rather than fostering paranoia, this allows us to ensure maximum safety based on a realistic assessment of threats and vulnerabilities. So here's that five-step process. Step one is identify the information you want to protect. This is the simplest step. Determine what you want to protect. It might include plans that you have, procedures of how you do things, relationships and networks that you have, locations of events or actions or housing, timing of things that are going to happen, events and so on, movements, communications, purchases that you're making, and much, much more. Step two in this process is to develop a threat model to analyze these threats. In other words, you're going to determine who you need to protect this information from and what their capabilities are. 
then you want to assess how these capabilities may impact you in the particular situation you're dealing with. So in this stage, you should also ask yourself, what information does the adversary already know? Is it too late to, pr to protect sensitive information? If so, you need to determine what course of action you need to take to sort of mitigate the damage caused by this, plan for the ramifications, and prevent it from happening again in the future. So if you want to learn more about the capabilities of state agencies and private intelligence companies, you can look at some of the details we'll have in the show notes, like the Wikipedia page on the global surveillance disclosures, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, reading about PRISM and Tempora, reading about uh, corporate security companies and how they did their work at Standing Rock, reading about Stratfor, and so on. Step three in this process is the analysis of vulnerabilities. And now that you know what you need to protect and what the threats are, you can identify specific vulnerabilities. So for example, if you're trying to protect location information from state agencies and corporations, carrying a cell phone with you is a specific vulnerability. Because a cell phone triangulates your, in, your location and logs this information with the service provider every time it connects to cell towers. So if this phone is linked to you and your name, your address, your location will be regularly recorded anytime your cell phone is connected to cell towers. This process can be repeated to identify multiple vulnerabilities. And once you've determined these vulnerabilities, you can begin to draft your OPSEC measures to mitigate or eliminate the vulnerability. And there are spe three specific types of measures you can take. First is action controls. This is about eliminating, eliminating the potential vulnerability itself. So in this example, this would mean getting rid of your cell phone completely, never carrying a cell phone. That eliminates the vulnerability. That's an action control. The second type of measure you can take is called countermeasures. This means attacking the enemy's data collection using camouflage, concealment, jamming, or physical destruction. So one example of this would be using a Faraday bag to store your phone and only removing it from the bag in specific non-vulnerable locations that you're not concerned about having your location recorded. So this method might not eliminate all dangerous data tracking as cell phones have been known to be capable of uh, tracking and recording movement and location data just using their built-in compass and accelerometer, even when they have no access to GPS, cellular networks, and, and other radio frequencies. So you have to be careful with these things. But that's countermeasures. That's the second way. The third method is called counter-analysis, and this means confusing the enemy via deception and cover. So in this example, this would be something like giving your phone to a trusted friend who is moving to a different location so that your tracked location with the, the cell phone company, the service provider, appears different than your real location during a given period. So those are the three methods of OPSEC measures that you can take to mitigate or eliminate vulnerabilities. But now we're going to move on to step four in this whole OPSEC process. And that's the assessment of risk and countermeasures. Step four is basically all about conducting an in-depth analysis of which OPSEC countermeasures are appropriate to protect which pieces of information. This is where you do a cost-benefit analysis for each countermeasure. You want to ensure that your security measures are strong and adequate, but ideally they shouldn't hamper what you're trying to do. If they stop you from doing anything at all, that's not helpful. So you need to determine which factors are most important and make a judgment call about your course of action. And finally, we get to step five, which is applying your countermeasures. You put the plan into action. You implement your chosen controls, countermeasures, or counteranalysis methods. And once the operation is complete or as an ongoing basis, on an ongoing basis, you also want to reassess effectiveness, conduct research, analyze any mistakes you have made, and plan for the ramifications of these mistakes. Then improve your techniques and repeat the process. Finally, Operational security does not make sense for every single person. It's designed to protect groups of people engaged in high-risk activities, such as the military. Therefore, OPSEC is not a hobby or something to be practiced occasionally. The OPSEC procedure should be habitual and regular, because it only takes a short period of inattention to accidentally disclose information that could have dangerous consequences. The lessons of this article need to be combined with general activist security culture and basic forensic countermeasures to protect us from threats. It's important that we begin to shift our culture of activism towards revolutionary confrontation 
and this requires a serious shift in attitude. We need to look at ourselves as warriors in a life-and-death war for the future of the planet. And OPSEC provides us with a procedure for increasing our safety and reminds us to treat this struggle as seriously as it really is. So that's the end of the article on operational security, and I hope this process is useful to our listeners. As you can tell, this is a very organized, well-laid-out procedure, as things tend to be when they come from the military. And it can be very helpful to have this basic checklist to go down, step one through five, that you can take into account when you're planning any sort of action, event, you're in any sort of dangerous situation. But increasingly, as I write in this article, we need to move towards a more revolutionary culture in our organizing and in our action. And that means normalizing these types of tools. Even if you're not planning on being a revolutionary yourself, even if you're not planning on going underground and taking extreme actions to defend the planet, we need to be making this normal so that these ideas are circulating in our communities, so that everyone is familiar with operational security, what it means and how to do it, so that that becomes the norm, the baseline. That makes everyone safer. And when those people do step forward or do come into our communities and, and, and are ready to take more revolutionary action, they will be able to access the resources that they need and learn the skills that they need to be able to be safe and effective. You have been listening to The Green Flame, a Deep Green Resistance podcast. You can find us online at dgrnewsservice.org. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Please rate the show and leave us a review. Thank you for listening, and until next time.
Oh, yeah.